So today I'll talk a little bit about Vipassana. We talked about Sati. We talked about other things. We'll move on now to talk about Vipassana, which is the second part of what we're practicing. So to talk about Vipassana, it's useful to talk about it in the context of another word called Samatha. Samatha and Vipassana are two words that often go together. They, they mean very different things. And so the Buddha pointed out that there are the two qualities of meditation practice that are sort of salient qualities. Uh, in a way, you can think of them as the, the outcome of the practice. And I've said this before, we actually don't practice vipassana. We practice sati. So when we talk about satipatthana, vipassana, that's how you should understand these two parts. Satipatthana is what we practice. We never practice vipassana. You can't practice seeing clearly just like you can't practice letting go. You have to practice looking. You have to practice opening your eyes. Mindfulness is this act of grasping the object, focusing on the object facing the object, because if you never face it, you'll never see it clearly. And so once you've done that, seeing clearly comes right after it. But there's this other word, samatha, and it's important to understand that word as well. It helps to understand why sati is so important, and uh, exactly what quality our practice should take, and but what sort of results we should expect. And a lot is said about samatha and vipassana. For those of you who know these two words, you've probably heard many different explanations about them, and there's, there's actually controversy about them, differences of opinion about them. So it's, I'll make it quite simple, and you can believe me or not. Uh, but here's my explanation of what these two words are, based on the text that I've read. Um, quite, quite often, well, first and foremost, you have to understand, again, that these are qualities of mind. Samatha means tranquility. It's a pretty standard translation. Vipassana, again, means seeing clearly. So they're very different words. But they're useful to understand because when we talk about them as types of meditation, we have these words samatha kamatana and vipassana kamatana. Kamatana is an Pali word that means meditation or maybe meditation practice. Samatha kamatana refers to a meditation that has as its goal tranquility. Or more accurately, and here's where it's maybe a little controversial, but I don't think it should be. Meditation that only has the capacity to, call, to deliver samatha, tranquility. This is the, the claim that there are some types of meditation that just can't lead to vipassana. And so vipassana kamatana is meditation that has as its result vipassana, the seeing clearly. That's the result of it. But vipassana meditation also cultivates samatha. And so, honestly, it's the better of the two. It's a way of describing the difference that we claim exists between the Buddha's teaching and teachings outside of his, his dispensation. If you remember, if any of you have heard the stories, after he left home, after the Bodhisattva left home, he went and lived in the forest and 
found some teachers and he found two very famous teachers and learned all he could from them. And they taught him what must have been very powerful meditation practice. But he said about these practices, they only lead him to the Brahma realm. Only, you know. He said these don't lead to wisdom, they don't lead to understanding. This is the sense he got, that there are these practices that just, no matter how powerful they might be, how incredible the results might be, they just don't lead to, to wisdom. So we would say these don't, these are not vipassana kamakana. They don't have the capacity to allow you to see clearly. And that's where there's some contention. People say, well, why can't it be? Why isn't it? Why can't you practice this way and still see clearly? No? Any meditation should allow you to see clearly. That's the claim. And I can give a really good example that lets you see that this isn't actually true. That there are some meditations that just cannot. Some, some it's hard to see. And for some types of meditation, they're kind of borderline. But let's take an easy example first. An easy example is kasina meditation. Kasina, a kasina, kasina means totality. And what that refers to is trying to make your whole universe, the whole sphere of, of your perception, a single thing. It's quite simple, actually. It's simpler than it sounds. You take a, a, a simple object, a single object. And you focus your attention on that simple single object. Uh, the best example I can give you is a color. Let's say the color yellow. And so you focus on the color yellow and you just say to yourself, yellow, yellow, yellow. Red, red, let's say red, red, red is a simple color, right? Blue, blue. And you just repeat to yourself, blue, blue, or whatever the color you picked is. Just keep repeating it to yourself. And the way you do this is you, you actually get a, a piece of cloth or something, or to, in modern times maybe a piece of paper that's that color. Cut it into a circle, a perfect circle, as, as smooth as you can get, and just put it down in front of you and just stare at it with your eyes open, blue. And then close your eyes and try to see it with your eyes closed. And when you can't see it with your eyes closed, open your eyes again and look at the, the blue, blue. But when you can see it with your eyes closed, just focus on the blue color with your eyes closed. If you do this long enough, you don't need the physical circle anymore. You can just have your eyes closed and really have a clear blueness, a blue circle in your, in your uh, field of vision with your eyes closed. And this blue object is controllable. You start to, to train yourself to be able to expand it. Yeah, first of all, it's stable. So eventually it, it's fixed. Your, your mind is fixed and you're able to see the blue disc whenever you want. It's stable. It's quite pleasant as well. And it's controllable, so you can expand it to infinity eventually. When you get good at it, these kinds of meditation, this isn't the only kind, any meditation like this, you can really control and then you, you're able to expand it into infinity. And that's a very easy way to get into the what we call the immaterial trance state. These are what the sort of things that the Buddha's first, the Bodhisattva's first teachers taught him. But that type of meditation is in some ways antithetical not only can it not lead to vipassana, but it's antithetical because it leads to or it deals with perceptions of stability, um, satisfaction, and control. It's kind of like an illusion. You work hard and you have this state, and it seems like you found something that is stable, satisfying, and controllable, because your 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 mind is inclined in that direction. 
The problem is that it only works when your mind is inclined in that direction. So it's actually not stable, satisfying, and controllable at all, but you don't see that. And when you stop practicing, it disappears and you get you lose your capacity. It's like exercise. You stop weightlifting, your muscles start to deteriorate. The same goes with the mind. It's still based on causes and conditions, but you don't see that while you're in it. And, and as there's no perception of the, the instability of reality. So you, it's not able to help you see clearly the nature of reality for that reason. And there's many types of meditation that fall into that category. Metta meditation, where you think kind thoughts about other beings. Your object becomes the happiness, like a being, a perception of them being happy. And that object, that person, that being, is stable. And it's kind of satisfying to see them happy and to feel good about them. So these kinds of meditation are called samatha meditation. As I said about borderlines, a good borderline example is the breath. Is the breath samatha or is it vipassana? This is where there's a lot of contention. I think I've gotten into trouble suggesting that the breath is a concept. The problem is that breath, the breath going into your body isn't real. That's not, isn't real in the sense, that's not what you experience. The idea of the breath going into your body is just an idea. You have this idea that breath is going into your body. So if, for example, you say, in one, out one, or even just in, out, it's more likely to lead to this subtle, fixed sensation of, of of a, a concept of the breath and eventually lead you into trance states as well, samatha states. Much more likely than it's to help you see the, the unpredictable, uh, insubstantial, and uncontrollable nature of things. If, on the other hand, you focus on the sensations, like the heat or the cold feeling at the nose, or the pressure in the chest, or the pressure at the stomach, which over time becomes quite um, obvious as you start to relax, this is where you naturally breathe from. Uh, for those of you who are having trouble with the stomach, I recommend, just as a test, try lying down on your back. You, some people think, oh, my stomach just doesn't rise and fall, that must be just the way my body is made. Lie down on your back and you'll be quite surprised to see how gross, how obvious the rising and the falling is when you relax. The problem is our ordinary sitting state, we're quite tense. And over time this changes as you become relaxed and, and proficient at it. You will be able to relax and, and you'll see it just naturally. You can't force it, but over time it will come. But anyway, this so this experience is real. The tension in the stomach, the tension in the chest, the heat, or the cool feeling at the nose, these are real and they're unpredictable yeah. and they're uncontrollable and you're going to start to see that. The stomach is such a horrible object of meditation, it, it doesn't feel comfortable. It's, it's, it's something that is, it, it will betray you. your efforts to control it, your efforts to find a stable, satisfying, comfortable state of practice. And that's okay, that you shouldn't be trying to find a comfortable, stable, satisfying state of experience, because that's a reliance. Then you become dependent on that state, and you, you fail to see the, the unpredictable nature of reality. You start to, to, to think that if only I can maintain this, and here it's, it's based on delusion, the idea that that's somehow sustainable. And it's much inferior to the freedom that comes from being able to be at peace no matter what happens. It seems impossible almost. It seems like the only way you can be happy or at peace is if you find that stable, satisfying state. You know, that thing that's going to last forever, that thing that is, is, is going, maybe not forever, but at least for a long time, and that I'm going to be able to control and, and, and be happy with. It would be 
nice if such a thing existed, but it doesn't in this world. There is no such thing. And so anything that we cling to like that is just going to make us stressed and suffering. When we see that, through seeing the three characteristics, which is the basis of vipassana, we gain a different kind of happiness. It's a happiness that's called the nirmisa sukha. It's happiness that isn't dependent on an object. And it's much more, uh, much more powerful, much more reliable, right? because you don't have to rely on anything to be happy if you're independent. And the Buddha said in the Satipatthana Sutta, this is why he said, Anisito Juhihati, through mindfulness in the Satipatthana Sutta, one dwells independent. If you're dependent, dependent on pleasant feelings, dependent on the absence of pain, well, you're always going to be tossed to and fro as in this chain. You'll never truly be at peace. So this is the, the difference between vipassana and samatha. With the breath, again, it can be both. Uh, but the most reliable way to understand that you're practicing vipassana is when your object is the five aggregates. When your object, to put more simply, when your object is experience. Why did the Buddha, and this is something people miss, why did the Buddha talk so much about the six senses and the five aggregates? You read books about these things, talking about trying to explain why the Buddha taught them. And if, it's not, if it's not from a meditation perspective, you might not understand how important these are. This is the Buddha talking about experience, trying to describe the sorts of things experience directly and therefore the sorts of objects that can allow you to see clearly. So this is a, a background about how vipassana, the place vipassana has in the Buddha's teaching. What vipassana means in the sense, what, what is it that we're trying to see clearly? I've said this before, it's to see clearly three things. That inside of ourselves and in the world around us, everything is impermanent, changing, unpredictable. That inside of ourselves and in the world around us, everything is suffering, it's dukkha. That inside of ourselves and in the world around us, everything is anatta, non-self. To see these three things. This is the purpose. It doesn't sound very uh, inspiring, really, to see this. And so it takes some, I mean, it, it really requires some depth of understanding to appreciate these. You have to be able to appreciate the importance of being independent, of not being dependent, reliant on uh, unpredictable things. You have to understand that life is unpredictable. Many people who come to, medi to Vipassana meditation come because they're suffering, because they've seen the uncontrollable nature of things because they've seen change, they've realized that they just can't rely on stability and satisfaction or control. So people who have already seen the three characteristics are able to appreciate this. The reason why many people don't come and practice is because they either are happy or they, they, they seek happiness. They, they, they are uh, comfortable, right? If you're lucky in the world, Sometime, for some time, bad things won't happen to you. Maybe you have money, maybe you have a family, and it seems like everything's pretty good. For some people, they've never had to experience the three characteristics as a, a real source of suffering for them. And other people are, are maybe not in that state, but they just aren't clear in their mind enough. They've been taught, taught, right? We're taught by so many sources that if only you get this, if only you get that. And so they're seeking out, seeking in the wrong direction. So again, appreciation to all of you who I would say are seeking in the right direction.
often because you have experienced suffering in your life, so you've experienced the three characteristics, and you want to understand what is them, understand more deeply. So, I'd like to talk a little bit about the three characteristics, just to give a little bit more depth of understanding. It's easy to misunderstand them and, and uh, get turned off or turned away, you know, get, get uh, discouraged. You know, they, don't, they, they sound like they might not be something you ever want to see. It might not be something you believe. If I say everything inside of you and in the world around you is dukkha, you know, what the heck? That can't be true. So you have to, we have to explain what we mean uh, exactly. So impermanence is probably the easiest one to see. It's already in that much pop uh, culture. Everything changes. You know? It's a wise saying that you hear banded around. Everything changes. Change is the only constant. We, we know that we are not who we were when we were young. And we've seen ourselves getting old, we know that we're going to get old, we know that life is impermanent, we're going to die. We often ignore this fact and we're often kind of um, purposefully trying to avoid thinking about death or that we're getting old. And we can get lulled into a false sense of security. But impermanence is not so hard to, to understand theoretically. Except that in mindfulness, uh, impermanence is not this kind of intellectual idea of things not being the same as they used to be. It's not about things changing at all, because reality doesn't change. Reality arises and ceases. And so the truth of impermanence is what, what you're seeing in the meditation is the unpredictable uh, and the momentary nature of reality. It's part of a shift away from objects as lasting entities to experiences as momentary uh, phenomena. Right? Like your body, you think of yourself as sitting here, but sometimes you lose track of the body sitting because there are only the sensations and the sensations come and go. Thoughts, you find yourself thinking something and suddenly your mind is thinking something completely different. One moment you're perfectly at peace and calm and the next moment your mind is racing or vice versa. You think the practice is impossible and tolerable and then suddenly it's very peaceful and calm. The, the characteristic of impermanence is uh, signlessness. Signlessness means uh, no signal. There's nothing, there's no precursor telling you, hey, we're about to change, or you're about to lose this. Impermanence, learning impermanence is learning flexibility. We're not able to deal with all kinds of change, and so we react. A lot of our reactions come from change, especially as we become accustomed to a certain state. Right? We feel very calm and we're kind of uh, accustomed to that, uh, happy with it, we like it. And many of you have described being caught off guard when, when it's gone and wondering what you can do to bring it back and kind of being frustrated that you're, you're, you're not experiencing what you used to. This is being caught off guard by change, being caught off guard by, by uh, the disappearance of something that you relied upon. You were dependent upon. So the real peace and happiness that comes from meditation is much more challenging. It isn't dependent upon a calm state. It's a sense of peace no matter what happens, no matter what you experience, whether it's pain, whether it's thoughts, whether it's even emotions. Your mind is not reactionary to any of them. 
And this is the great benefit of seeing clearly impermanence. And as you see impermanence more clearly, it no longer bothers you the way it used to change, loss, or the arising of things that you don't want to arise. You become much less surprised, much less uh, disturbed. The characteristic throughout the course is going to be um, when something strange occurs, something you didn't expect. That's a sign that you're starting to, to broaden your horizons and become more flexible. You'll notice that you're, you're surprised. You really didn't expect it to change like this or change like that. That's a sign of this, this process of growth. You're seeing impermanence. As far as suffering, well, there's a lot you can say about suffering. And we, all, we have to always uh, clarify what we mean here because people's understanding of what suffering is is um, usually restricted to what we call dukkha vedana. There's four kinds of suffering, dukkha vedana, dukkha sabhava, and uh, dukkha lakana, and dukkha satcha. The feeling of suffering, the reality of suffering, the characteristic of suffering, and the truth of suffering. And this is how it goes. An ordinary person experiences suffering, or no, perceives suffering as being a feeling. In other words, a certain part, a certain uh, potential aspect of reality, and most importantly, a part of reality that you can avoid. So as long as you don't feel pain, you've escaped suffering, right? And this can be emotional pain or it can be physical pain, but as long as you have ways to, to avoid this, you know, then you'll be happy. One of the things you're learning in meditation is that the more you try to avoid the pain, the more unpleasant it becomes. It actually isn't a, a, a solution to try and avoid it. So this is an ordinary understanding, and I said that many of you have experienced suffering. What I meant is, is you experience what we call dukkha sabhava. And sabhava means something like reality or uh, existential reality. But what, it, what this means is that a person who is inclined towards spirituality is usually inclined because they've seen that suffering actually is, in many cases, unavoidable. There are at least uh, times in your life where there is no way out of suffering. You know, people who get really bad headaches they can only take so much pain medication. When you're sick or have arthritis, you try and try to take this medication. Or people go in, in Los Angeles all the time. People were going to these acupuncture, acupressure, etc., etc. Massage therapists. Thai massage is an interesting thing. I used to teach in Thailand. And I talked to people about Thai massage, people who went to get Thai massages, people who, who studied Thai massage. And I talked to a masseuse and, and we were talking about it and she said, yeah, the truth is, I can teach them massage, but I know they're just going to come back in a week or a month and need another one. Because the tension, the stress that's causing the pain isn't going away. They're not getting rid of that through the massage. When we get in an accident, uh, anyone who's been through great uh, stress, if you, if you go through loss, when you lose a loved one, when there's a breakup, unrequited love, <laughs> so much stress and suffering and you just feel like there's no end. Nowadays for, for sickness, there's a, a case recently, someone, uh, they, they laud it as a, 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 a triumph. But someone in Colombia, I think, um, was given assisted suicide for a non-life-threatening illness. 
And, and so I'm against this, and I'm not going to stop someone from doing it, but I'm absolutely against it. And as Buddhists, I think we should be against it because of how great an opportunity it is, first, to be a human being, but second, to, to go through the suffering that you're experiencing. It's certainly not a great idea to try and avoid it by killing yourself from, from a Buddhist perspective because you end up being reborn in the place that is based on that aversion, based on that, that disliking of the pain, the disliking of the suffering. But for many people, again, this is an impetus for them to, to come to spirituality. Why? Because it's not just a, a part of reality that you can avoid. The realization that you can't avoid suffering, that you can't avoid hunger, thirst. There's one, one monk in Bangkok told a story about, he said, uh, I heard about this monk who was take, going on the ferry in Bangkok. They go on these ferries from one dock to the other or up and down the river. I think I went, went on one of them once. And this old monk, and he had taken some kind of, uh, I don't know what he'd had to eat or something, but he was on the boat and suddenly he had indigestion. And like in the middle of the river and all these people crowded around the boat. So he just sat there and he, 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 he uh, expelled diarrhea in his robes and just sat there. And when they got to the dock, he jumped over the side of the boat into the river and, and swam, swam to the dock and you know, washed himself off, swam to the dock and went home. And the teacher was saying, said, boy, if that's not suffering, I don't know what is. Unavoidable. Sometimes unpleasant things, things you, you really want to avoid, you can't avoid. I don't know, maybe that's non-self more, but I thought that as a part of suffering. But this is a, a, an impetus for people to begin to, to, to find another way, saying, look, if I can't uh, avoid suffering, is there another way? And it's a very important question. It's a very important um, perspective. Because that's really the essence of this. It's about facing the things that we really think we should be avoiding. We really think we should be, be freeing ourselves from. Mindfulness is about facing. The third is Dukkha Lakana, and that's what we're talking about here. What you, what you are discovering now as, you've, as spiritual people, because that's what you are. Or, you know, if you want to be secular about it, as people training their minds. And you are starting to see the characteristic of suffering. And what does that mean? That means the characteristic of every aspect of experience as not being satisfying. Right? It's not actually that it's painful. Obviously, some experiences are quite pleasant. But they're dukkha, meaning they're not sukha. Because again, just like impermanence, this is only meant to free us from our uh, wrong perspective of satisfaction, that this will satisfy me, that will satisfy me. If I get the new phone, that will satisfy me. You know, if, oh, after lunch, boy, I'm so hungry, but once I eat, then I'll be satisfied. I'm in so much pain, my leg is in so much pain, but when I move my leg, then I will be happy. Once I, uh, when I feel calm, then I'll be happy. And that will that will satisfy me, and it doesn't, because then the calm goes away, and you know, I gotta go find it again. And when you can't find it, you're unhappy. You start to see this that um, there isn't a refuge. There isn't something that you can cling to and say, "Okay, this will keep me safe, and I won't suffer." The attitude of trying to find such a thing, trying to cling to something as a refuge. You have, it's, it's very deep, right? But from birth, what are we taught? Cling to your parents. Your parents will protect you. Now, some people's parents do not protect them, but for many this is what we're taught. You know, someone to protect me, something that I can cling to. For many theists, uh, is clinging this uh, well it's it, it, it is it doesn't bear the fruit that you think it bears this is what you're starting to see or 
more importantly, you're starting to see actually a, a better alternative to the, again, anisito, anisito to the hanaki, dwell independent. Do not cling to anything in the world. Or in the Mangala Sutta, again, Buddha dami hichitanyasana kampati. When one's mind doesn't waver in the, the loka dhamma, loka dhamma are the, the good things, bad things, basically. When you experience the vicissitudes of the world, the vicissitudes of life, the changes, when you're not wavering, oh, this is good, or oh, this is bad, when you're able to experience without reaction. This is called dukkha sabhava. That's right, dukkha lakana. It's a characteristic of everything. No, that's not satisfying me. You, you thought it was, but no, it turns out it's not. You start to see this about everything. This is like a bird in a tree. In the commentary, they say it's like a bird in a tree, jumping from a fruit tree, jumping from branch to branch, looking for fruit. No, this branch, no fruit. That branch, no fruit. That's dukkalakana. Starting to learn that this tree, the branches that you would cling to are, are not worth clinging to. That one. This is what you're starting to see. Until finally, dukkha, dukkha satcha, the truth of suffering, which we've all right, heard of, the first noble truth. All that means is that you finally realize that none of the branches have any fruit on them. And then what do you do? You fly away. When the bird flies from the tree, that flying away is the is is freedom from suffering. It's the result of dukkha satcha. When the bird says, "This tree has no fruit," that's dukkha satcha. And this is what happened. It's not intellectual, but the mind gets it. There's a moment. There will come a moment in your practice. At some time, you're all on the path. It may not be today or tomorrow or this course or next course. There will come a time where, not intellectually. Your mind suddenly understands, appreciates nothing is worth. There's nothing. None of nothing here is going to satisfy you. And it doesn't fly away per se. It, it, it lets go. It doesn't go anywhere. But it like stops seeking out. And it, it drops into nibbana. There's this cessation experience. It doesn't go anywhere. No, nothing to be afraid of. Just cessation. Just okay. Time out. <laughs> Peace. And it lets go. That's called Dukkha Satcha. Seeing that. As for Anatta, Anatta is the hardest one to explain. Uh, easily misunderstood, very frightening, confusing. It's most confusing when you take it intellectually. If you think of Anatta as an intellectual idea, like I have no self, there is no self, no, it's, it's not very helpful. So, I've said this before, I remember saying this in Sri Lanka and I got in big trouble from the audience. They were, what is he talking? I said, the Buddha never said there is no self. The Buddha never said there is no self. And the problem with saying that is, it implies, oh, so there is the possibility of a self? I would say, no, there is no possibility of a self, but it, it's not useful to think like that. These kind of thoughts are conceptual. It's like saying, is there a hat? Right? Or does this hat have a self? Because it's not just myself, it's also this hat having a self. That seems kind of weird, right? We don't think of selves, hats as having a self, but that's basically what we're talking about. It's only because we have this sort of religious, quasi-religious idea of a soul, a self, that we distinguish. The hat has selfness, right? As much as I do. Right? The hat is here, and it's not, the napkin is not the hat. They're separate selves. This self is self. So a big part of, of um, self is entity. This is an entity, a thing, thingness. Thingness of the of the this right. This is a thing, right? Now, what is it? There's two things now. Right. So where'd the napkin go? 
right? You, you saw the mannequin, where did it go? It didn't ever exist in the first place. It existed up here. This is the kind of idea of self, is the entity. You want a, a, more, a more visceral example? What is this, Chris? It's like a fist bump. It's a fist. Okay, everybody watch the fist. Where's the fist? What happened? It's gone. Oh, it's back. Right? This, is, this one is nice because it's five and that's the five aggregates. Right? This is the entity, this is the five aggregates. Entities don't exist. There, there are, are kind of, you could say, lazy, but very practical way of looking at the world. It's practical for me to say, oh yeah, this is a hat. I know, if I didn't know it was a hat, I wouldn't know to put it on my head and keep me warm. Right? A napkin I know is useful, or was useful, to, um, to wipe things up. So in a worldly sense, we, we have to, and therefore we get into this this kind of, we fall into this sort of believing in the actual existence of it. And, and it's really just a useful convention to say when you knit this together, it becomes a hat, it becomes a thing in a certain shape that is useful to be used to put on your head. We do the same with, with a human being. Right? A human being can be dissected. When a, when a person dies, we start to waver. You ever see a person in a coffin, you have to ask yourself, is that person and, and you can feel this kind of tension in you where your mind struggles to, to is it a, it is it isn't right and so there are actual meditations that help you conceptually this isn't vipassana but they conceptually help you get free yourself or see the the conceptual nature when you watch a, a body decompose monks would do walking meditation beside a decomposing corpse that they could look at, or they might sit and stare at the decomposing corpse, and you can see at some point your mind starts to waver, well it's not actually the same. So in brief, um, in regards to being an entity, it's, um, it relates to how you experience things. It isn't intellectually, is there a self, isn't there a self, do I have a self? Do I not have a self? Those kind of thoughts aren't based on reality. It, they're, they're abstract. Let's just not think about that, not worry about that. That isn't what this is about. is isn't what any of this is about, right? This whole course is not about theory or philosophy. It's about experience and the truth of experience. Is this really a hat? No, it's seen, right? And so the same goes with ourselves. And this is this is an issue because our reliance on entities has created some attachments. My hat, my phone, my robe, my body. When I get sick, I'm, I'm afraid. Maybe I'll die. This body, you know, it's my, I will die. So, so something that was supposed to be practical becomes a burden, becomes a hindrance. And then someone says something not nice to you, or someone criticizes you. I don't deserve to be talked talk, talk to like that. When we're criticized, we can see this quite clearly, how we become defensive. Uh, when we feel inferior or, or um, uh, insufficient, we can have low self-esteem. Or when we have high self-esteem, we, we, we feel like, We think we're ugly, we think we're tall or short, so on. A lot of our suffering comes from attachment to self, and, and really you could say that we wouldn't um, worry or we wouldn't strive for uh, happiness if it wasn't for us, if it wasn't meant to be for me to be happy. If you can get rid of self, then there is no sense in your mind of, of, um, of identification with things. And this is an important part, it, 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 you may not realize this, but this is an important part of how you come to experience suffering without, or experience pain, for example, without suffering. Because pain goes from being, I'm in pain, 
to being just an ex uh, a thing, alien, a characteristic of uh, of anatta, of non-self, is alien, foreign. So that it, when you start to see pain as just like a thing that arises in front of you, it's over there. <laughs> no? How how is that my pain? It's way over there, right? Because that's the truth of it. It is way over there. So it's that guy's problem over there, not mine. I mean, no, you don't think like that, but it, it starts to take on that perspective that it's just that thing over there. When you lose the perception of the me and mine in things, in your experiences. So that's all anatta means. Uh, one part of it. Now, it, it is complex, complex. It's not just a single thing. There are like four different kinds of understanding of self that we have to, to deal with, but they all go away in the same sort of way of seeing clearly. When you start to see clearly, you stop identifying. But another important aspect of non-self is uh, the uncontrollable nature. Not having a lord, not being mine. Right? So our, our attempts to control things are a huge part of the problem and a huge part of the cause for us to suffer. We, they, they encourage us to desire and to get disappointed when our efforts to control are, are met with failure. So, um, our perspective, an important part of the change of, in perspective has to be this um, move away from trying to control. And that's what you're going to, that, that's going to be effective because of what you're going to see as you see that um, your efforts for control are either uh, impotent or, or conducive of suffering. They lead to more suffering. You watch as you try to control the stomach, right? I'll make it smooth. And the more you try, the more uncomfortable it becomes. The more stressed you become. You start to notice that there's a pattern. Anything that you try to control leads to more tension, more stress, more anxiety even, as you worry about whether you're going to be successful and then whether it's going to disappear or so on, whether something you've controlled uh, to get away from is going to come back. Right? And, and then when it does come back, there's this disappointment and suffering. So a big part of becoming independent is in giving up this idea that, that, that you have a duty or you, you, that um, you have a relationship with the experience as trying to control it or trying to fix it. Seeing things as problems, seeing things as uh, issues to be solved. Your mind starts to change and you start to see those things that normally people would say as problems, they see them just as experiences. Remember there was one case in our monastery um, we were sitting, I was sitting with Ajahn Tong doing recording, and suddenly someone came in and said, there's a, there's a, one of the nuns has gone crazy right outside of this kuti. There's a nun over here, she's going crazy. And everyone went like this, rubbernecking to look, and Ajahn Tong just sits in it like this. He was, I just looked at him, and he's just, just, sitting, just sitting there, you know. And then they said, they said to him, he said, oh yeah, tell him to be mindful. It struck me very, very clearly, like the, the idea of, um, you know, it's, a, it's a, this is another experience. When, when everyone else is stressed about everything, stressed about the problems in the world, right? Stressed about problems in your life. It's not easy and it's not pleasant to think of, but the only actual solution is to be at peace with your experience. The good, the good side is once you're at peace with even bad experiences, they tend to get better because you're not messing up, messing up. you're not uh, creating animosity with other people or tension with others. Um, but even having no food to eat is still just an experience, something that you can start to relate to here when you, you eat less and you see, well, actually hunger is not as scary as I thought it was. I thought I had to sleep more, and oh, not sleeping isn't that scary. You, know? you need to sleep less. 
you start to realize that actually, if this is taken to its natural conclusion, everything I experience, even if I get in a car accident, it will still just be experiences similar to what I'm experiencing here. And so you, you, you start to change your perspective as being uh, a thing that you have to solve. So the sense of identification and responsibility starts to change. And you, you can still act. You still act in the world, you still fix things and so on, but your perspective is like, okay, well now I do this. And when you can't um, do something, you don't have any need to fix your problems. So you don't suffer. If you have to go hungry, you go hungry. If you get sick, you get sick. If you die, well, we all die. You start to gain a perspective that is truly safe from suffering. There's nothing in the world that, that can harm you. This is kema, safety, is a very important part of the attainment of enlightenment. So it could sound very radical, but um, it's not something that you just jump into. But what happens is it's, you, you're gradually um, freeing yourself from worries and stresses and fears. It, it's not like something scary to worry about. It's something that should be liberating at all times. You start to see that the things that are causing you stress and suffering don't have to cause you stress and suffering. You start to let go of them. This comes, this is the fruit and the benefit of the practice of vipassana, which ultimately leads to, as I said, a, a perfect letting go where the mind lets go completely and really finds peace. So I think that's uh, enough for today. Talked a little bit about samatha and vipassana and the three characteristics which are the essence of vipassana, and that's what you're going through now. You're just starting to gain this better perspective, this perspective that allows you to let go and be independent in the world. Nothing complicated, nothing hard to understand. Quite simple, and yet so so difficult. I understand. I sympathize. And I wish you all success in your practice and hope that this is a this is a uh, fruitful and beneficial experience for all of you.